55,000 French and probably a couple of Portuguese descended on the, uh, <laughs> the Stade Velodrome in Marseille, a stone throw from the uh, French Riviera. He played again for France in uh, 1986 World Cup and where they would lose to the Germans in the semi-finals <laughs> on penalty <laughs> again. Sound familiar? Yes. <laughs> Tournament was Platini. It was France. It was magnifique. <laughs> <laughs> Something else that Euro 88 was known for was the rare occurrence of a whole tournament with no sendings off, no goalless draws, and no, <laughs> no extra time or penalties. Wow. wow. Then Netherlands faced England and blew them away with a Van Basten hat-trick in Peter Shilton's 100th game for England. <laughs> <laughs> wow. But they're only allowed to take 20, yeah. although England only only managed to take 19. Brilliant. Because uh, by all accounts, Taylor selected Mark Wright, but didn't realise that he was injured. And on the day where they were <laughs> on the day where they were heading off, he's like, oh, where's, where's Mark Wright? One of his teammates, oh, he's still up in Liverpool. <laughs> Um, but by then the deadline had passed and they couldn't bring in another player so they went with 19 oh rather God. than 20. We're red, we're white, we're Danish dynamite. Um, Danish dynamite. Well, they sung it in English. Uh, I guess so, yeah. didn't rhyme in Danish. No, maybe it did. Barry Davis commentary of Brolin, Darlene, Brolin, brilliant! <laughs> right into the top corner, 82nd minute crushed England hearts and Sweden go through. Brolin! Darlene! Brolin! Brilliant! Brilliant goal! We're back with Euro 84 and uh, it needed to be a good one because the, the tournament actually faced the possibility of being axed if it was another bad tournament because it was getting so little support. But boy, did it deliver. In the uh, balmy... Gaelic summer of 1984 gave us one of the greatest Euros in history. And uh, in my research, it's often been referred to as people's favourite ever Euros in their history, people that were there to, to witness it. And um, it's, it's actually one that people on, on our shores in, in Britain didn't really witness much at all because, because we didn't qualify. None of the home nations qualified. It wasn't televised. Not at all. Um, so... No, well, they showed uh, one of the group stages matches. Uh, I think it was Spain v West Germany, and which wasn't even a great match. <laughs> and they showed and they showed the final, uh, and that was it. Sore losers. <laughs> yes, yeah, sore losers. Yeah. But the format was changed from from 1980, so they still had eight teams, two groups of four, but the top two went through to play semi-finals rather than going straight to the, the finals. Uh, the third and fourth playoff scrapped, never to return. Hey. Uh, <laughs> and this format uh, is kind of much more like the, the tournament style formats we're used to today with a group stage going into knockout rounds. And, uh, and this exact format and a number of teams stayed the same for the subsequent eight European championships. Spoiler. Uh, spoiler alert, yeah. <laughs> now, uh, France were chosen as hosts, and um, they were actually one of the favourites for the tournament. And it's kind of it's what I like to see in a tournament. It's like a classic international tournament in a uh, the host country being one of the favourites, and it's a kind of football mad country, good, good stadiums, good fans, and, and kind of a theme to it, um, unlike something like the, the World Cup we've just had in Qatar. And I think this current Euros in, in Germany is back to it from the last one being split across different countries, right? This, this Euros being in Germany, the current one we're watching at the moment, is, uh, is kind of back to this kind of classic style where, where the, uh, the host country is somewhere that you would actually... Um, associate with being a football footballing nation as well and they did yeah so france did have a, a chance to win this they, they didn't have much of a history uh at this point in in football but but it was quite exciting times for the the french team other teams 
Portugal and Romania were making their debuts. Uh, Portugal had only played in um, the World Cup in 66, the Eusebio, Eusebio. tournament. Um, but apart from that, nothing. This is Portugal's first uh, first outing. That's so weird to think of Portugal not being a like an absolute regular team, isn't it? Yeah, from what we see today, yeah, it's um, it's very strange. But yeah, and like I said, England um, were there as well as Ireland, Northern Ireland, Scotland, and Wales didn't qualify and wasn't televised over here. Uh, world champions Italy didn't qualify. Uh, Soviet Union, Euro specialists in the past, did not qualify. Czechoslovakia, Hungary, and the Netherlands didn't qualify. <laughs> who, who didn't qualify? <laughs> We did that. <laughs> but um, qualifying was, I, I, after seeing all these teams that didn't qualify, qualify I thought I'm going to have a look at the qualifying rounds. It, it, it's, it was crazy. In England's group, we narrowly missed out to Denmark after losing to them at Wembley. And this is the first ever time Denmark kind of had a, an exciting team with the emergence of um, Mike, one Michael Aldrup and um, they had a few others in there, but um, it was kind of the first time Denmark were were a force. Apart from that, England did pretty well in the qualifying. So they lost that game to Denmark, but they also lost to Greece. And if they'd have beaten Greece, they would have they would have qualified I- I- instead of Denmark. Oh, we needed and, we um, needed a Beckham Beckham free kick. Be- yeah, we needed a Beckham free kick. <laughs> John Barnes wasn't quite enough. But actually, saying that, the um, match that everyone was talking about in England was the England-Brazil friendly in the summer of 84 at the American R, where John Barnes oh, scores the Wonder Cup. Yeah, if, we'd, if we'd have qualified for the uh, Euros, that, that never, never happened. happened. Yeah. <laughs> Italy were, were pretty dreadful in qualifying after winning the World Cup two years earlier. A lot of their team were really old they were pretty old when they won the world cup and they were kind of on their way out retiring they only actually won one game in the whole of their qualifying wow now uh northern ireland uh beat west germany home and away in qualifying (laughs) and they were 11 minutes away from qualifying until the germans scored a late winner against albania to take their place (laughs) Uh, the Netherlands actually thought they had qualified uh, as Spain needed to win by 11 goals in their last game against Malta and they were only 3-1 up at half time so you can imagine the Dutch fans were were already celebrating sounds similar to the San Marino where we needed to beat them yeah (laughs) yeah I think Malta I don't think were like that much of, of whipping whipping boys at the time. They, I think Spain had only been, been something like 2-0 mm-hmm. uh, in Malta. Um, and then they scored nine goals in the second half to go through. Wow. <laughs> wow. That's impressive. And, uh, and has that ever happened? At that yeah. Level? Nine yeah. Goals in a half. Well, there was a lot. There was, it was quite controversial. This was one of the big triggers for all final games to be played at the same time, because Spain were obviously playing after the Dutch had played, so they knew how many goals they needed to score. So if they were playing at the same time, they might not have might not have happened the same way. Sounds like something happened at half time. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. So well, it reminded me of one of our five aside uh, leagues when we thought we'd won because uh, the, oh, the, yeah. the the team, the only team that could beat us, needed to, needed to win like. Nine nil in, a, in matches were only five minutes each way, yeah, and they were and, a good team. Yeah, but we found out they in the pub afterwards that they were all sat with, they, they were sat with the other team that they beat, who they were mates with. <laughs> so uh, we, were <laughs> we were robbed <laughs> of another small trophy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we'll do another podcast episode on that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Watch this thing. Wales were all set to go through until Yugoslavia scored a winner in the dying seconds of stoppage time against Bulgaria uh, to snatch that that berth. And um, France actually qualified for the first time since 1960, first edition of the tournament. First time, like I was saying, France had a really good team, uh, a lot down to one Michel Platini, 
who at this time was the current Ballon d'Or holder, uh, played for Juventus, top goal scorer in Syria. Um, I, I kind of chosen not to talk about anything to do with Platini post um, football <laughs> in this because uh, this tournament is really all about Platini. So, uh, so I'll, I'll stick to the football on this one. France had got to the semi-final in the World Cup two years earlier, 1982, and were knocked out on penalties to Germany. And you might uh, know it for the Schumacher challenge Uh, where he uh, completely wipes out and (laughs) pretty much maims. (laughs) Is it Batillon, the French striker? I can't remember his name. Um, But yeah, apart from that, the only other kind of performance to note was uh, the 1958 World Cup where Juice Fontaine scored 13 goals (laughs) in, uh, in one World Cup, a record. Which still stands to this day. Yeah. yeah. Got yes, yes. Wow. Where they, and France got to the got to the semis in that World Cup as well. Um, but at the, at the time, rugby was actually bigger than football in France uh, in the early eighties. So, um, so this was kind of the the start of what we see as as France today, as the uh, the big footballing nation they are. In the opening game, Platini scored a late winner against Denmark. Uh, and then he goes on in the group stages to score another a hat trick against Belgium, and then another hat trick against Yugoslavia. Two hat tricks uh, in one the, tournament. It, two hat tricks. Yeah, uh, his hat trick against Belgium was a perfect hat trick, left foot, right foot header, and um, so he finishes those three games, seven goals, and France were kind of cruising through, and they they're playing this. Um, like beautiful, stylish, attacking football, refusing to kind of play any other way. And um, and it, it's all, all going going to plan so far. Uh, Denmark finished second in their group to make the other semis. Uh, like I said, this was a, 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 the first signs of a good Danish side. Um, and the other group was very close, but very low scoring. And uh, I had a look at Germany's starting lineups for their Groups games, Matt, and I'm afraid to say there was no Muller. No. <laughs> but there was That's a, right. vo- a Voller. <laughs> no, I mean, Rudy Voller. Close. Uh, but yeah, no Muller, no party. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, Voller scored a, scored a double against Romania. And uh, going into the final game, West Germany were top, but it was all very close. And then uh, Portugal were playing Romania and they scored uh, an 81st minute winner, which meant they would go through. They would confirm them going through. And then Spain scored in stoppage time, a stoppage time winner against West Germany to knock the Germans out. And it meant they win the group and go through. So the semifinals were France, Portugal and Denmark be Spain. Now, France, Portugal semi final. This is said to be one of the greatest Euro games of all time. This semi final. There's uh, 50,000, 55,000 French and probably a couple of Portuguese descended on the, uh, <laughs> the Stade Velodrome in Marseille, a stone throw from the uh, French Riviera. Uh, and uh, Jean Francois de Merck was playing left back due to. Um, uh, the uh, the first choice left back being sent off in the group stages, uh, and he was currently winning one of his only nine caps that he got in his career for Spain uh, for France. Sorry, uh, and then France get a free kick in the twenty fourth minute, which obviously Platini's the free kick taker. For some reason, he let Jean Francois de Merg take the free kick, and uh, I watched this free kick back, and he just steps up and rifles it into the top corner. The, op- the opposite side of the goal to the wall, bang, straight in to score his first ever goal for France. Um, and now France are kind of controlling the game. They've got a, they have a lot of chances, but they can't convert. convert. And then um, Jordao scores an equaliser for Portugal in the 71st, 74th minute, and it goes to extra time. And then Jordao scores again in extra time to put Portugal 2 1 up before De Merck scores. An equaliser for France in his 
second and final ever goal for France. <laughs> <laughs> what an impact. <laughs> Now it looks like it, it was all it was heading for penalties, and uh, France just keep attacking, keep attacking. And uh, Jean Ticana, who you might remember as a former former Fulham manager, yet but he was a probably um, the, the second best player in the French team at this time to Platini. He breaks free in the final minute of the game and uh, plays in no no one else but Michel Platini who uh, makes no mistake and sends them through to the final. But so in the other semi-final, Spain actually beat Denmark on penalties. Uh, it was much, much, much more close a match. Denmark were actually um, re- doing really well. Like Michael, Michael Laudrup's first ever tournament, and he was uh, making a big impact. But it went to penalties after a 1-1 draw. Spain scored all five uh, and Denmark missed one, which which saw Spain through to a final against France. And in the final, it wasn't quite the game that the semi final was. And like I said earlier, this was the the only real game that was being shown uh, in the UK. Uh, so they missed the kind of amazing semi final. And apparently, a lot of uh, British reporters were just there for the final. They didn't go to the to the semi final, and then the, the the final was actually quite drab. And they came back saying, "Oh, the tournament wasn't even worth <laughs> worth, worth talking about." And there's a, there's a book that someone's written called, which was out fairly recently, called "The the Greatest Tournament You've Never Seen," and it's all about the uh, the 1984 Euros. But um, true to form, Platini scores the opener in the final, his ninth goal in five games and they end up winning 2-0 to uh to lift the trophy in in front of their home fans and uh the, that nine goals in in a european championships is um a record that stands to this day as uh, most ever goals in a in a european championship wow. who was the um who was the next highest scorer uh in one tournament in one championship no, no, in this I, tournament like how far was he ahead of the next. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, I think the next score I had like three. And, um, and that's even more impressive because it was a smaller tournament. Yeah. There wasn't more rounds, was there? Yeah. Only Five teams. games. Yeah. Five games. That's, that's some. But, the, some it, but he's also the second highest European Championships goal scorer overall. Just from one tournament. Just from one tournament. Oh, really? The only. Yeah. Player the only player that's got more goals than him in European Championships is Cristiano Ronaldo. Yeah. And Cristiano Ronaldo took five tournaments to beat him. <laughs> and five <laughs> bigger tournaments with more ma- with yeah, potentially yeah, more matches. Five bigger tournaments. And um I had a look I had a look at oh who's playing in this the current tournament who might be able to catch him. And the closest is actually another Frenchman. Uh Anton Greensman, who's on seven. Uh-huh. Who could uh, who could overtake Platini, but um, but yeah, and you think Mbappe, who's scored already scored so many World Cup mm. goals, is, he's he didn't score in his first Euros, he hasn't scored in this one, and he's out with a broken nose. Now. Spoiler, so, um, spoilers, spoilers, <laughs> spoilers. We haven't got to that. <laughs> but, um, he's still young, but yeah, do well to score nine and he is, in this very, tournament. He's a very very good player. He's a very good. He player. He's a very good player. Following the the 1984 tournament, Platini would go on to win the second his second Ballon d'Or of his three in a row Ballon d'Ors that he won. Did he get three in a row? He got three in a row. Wow. Yeah, 83, 84, 85. He played again for France in uh, 1986 World Cup and where they would lose to the Germans in the semifinals <laughs> on penalty <laughs> again. Sound familiar? Yes. <laughs> but he actually retired before Euro 88, which is why his nine... European Championship goals are are the only goals, only European Championship goals he's got. But um, good enough to uh, to leave him in that in that record books as as such an amazing championship. But yeah, the tournament tournament was Platini. It was France. It was magnifique. <laughs> <laughs> He may not have had a, a chance to score any more goals anyway, because as a shock, France didn't qualify for the, fi- <laughs> the for the finals of Euro '88, um, oh. and it's the last time 
they haven't qualified for a Euro. Um, oh, right. And it's the last time a reigning champion hasn't qualified for the following uh, tournament. So even if he's continued playing for France, maybe he wouldn't have, um, or maybe they didn't qualify because he retired. Who knows? So off the back of the uh, format changes for 84, 88 followed the same format. Eight teams, two groups of four. Top two go through to semi-finals and finals. No third and fourth place playoff. Uh, it was hosted in West Germany, uh, ah. who had won the topical. Yes, who had won the uh, the bid to host it. They'd beaten a, a joint Scandinavian bid, and uh, that, uh, that received one vote, and an England bid that received no votes. <laughs> 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 Um, but both both would go on to yeah. have their time. Yes, it, feel, it feels like every tournament we've reviewed so far nearly was held in England. Yes, <laughs> it does feel like th- that for a lot of tournaments in our in my life. I think. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they were knocked out uh, France, so they were knocked out in qualifying by our old Euro Championship favourites, the Soviet Union. Ah, they, they're back. They're back <laughs> with a vengeance. Um, <laughs> I mean, France had finished third in the previous World Cup as well. So they won the Euros, then finished third in the World Cup and didn't make. It shows like with an eight-team format, you're going to lose. There's going to be some big mm. big teams that don't make it because there's like yeah, 32 yeah. qualifiers. Um, other, it was, there weren't as many shocks in qualifying as in 84. Uh, Belgium, the 1980 runners-up, and the the World Cup eighty six semi finalists didn't qualify, um, and Portugal that we were just talking about got to the semi final. They also didn't qualify for the eighty eight. Mm. Belgium didn't qualify because they got knocked out in qualification. Well, the team that won their group stage were Ireland, who qualified for the mm. for a major tournament for the first time in their history mm. under wow. the managership of Jack Cholton. West Germany obviously qualified as hosts, and I've already mentioned it, that uh, the Soviet Union qualified. This was both countries' fifth appearances in the uh, the, the champ- in a finals championship so far, which is uh, was more than anyone else. But it was the last time that these teams would appear in as as they are, because by the next tournament, uh, Germany had unified. And yeah. uh, the USSR had disintegrated into 15 countries. Mm. Spoiler alert. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, um, so, yes, it was sort of the end of, a, of an era, but yeah. the beginning of a new dawn. Something else that Euro 88 was um, known for was it's the, the rare occurrence of a, of a whole tournament with no sendings off, no goalless draws, and no, <laughs> no extra time or penalties. Wow. wow. When's, when's this never happen? <laughs> no. no sendings off, I think I'm most surprised about. Yeah. yeah. It's all well, no penalty off. shoot. I mean, it's, it's, not it's even extra time. People. Not even extra times. Wow. That is very surprising. Yeah. yeah. So in a, a couple of political things occurred. So in, in um, the planning for it, West Germany made the choice not to host any matches in West Berlin because there was a, a, there was a disagreement with the Eastern Bloc about whether West Berlin was part of West Germany. That was still ongoing. So in order that no Eastern European members would pull out of the tournament, they decided to not host any games in Berlin. Uh, weirdly, right. weirdly, they, three games in the 1974 World Cup were hosted in Berlin, but I guess tensions had grown on that. Mm-hmm. Uh, but they did hold a little uh, four nation tournament in Berlin uh, the previous year that included Russia and West Germany as a kind of make up for it. Um, okay. So the opening match was between two of the tournament favorites, which were West Germany and Italy. So the hosts who had won Euro 1980 and they were, had been runners up in the last two world cups. <laughs> uh, and they were also the hosts, so they were sort of very yeah. commonly considered the favourites. Uh, the, the Italians, despite not having played in '84, had obviously won the '82 World Cup, so they weren't seen as as outsiders. 
Roberto Mancini scored the first goal of the tournament. Ah, big name. <laughs> uh, who has obviously had success as an Italy manager in the tournament at some point yep. in the future. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> nice boy. <spoiler. laughs> I don't know if you remember uh, around this time. I remember around this time because I was playing in goal a bit, but there were changes of rules to to the how long a goalkeeper could hold on to the ball and stuff. Yeah. Um, so the 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 equaliser for West Germany was scored from a free kick after Walter Zenger took more than four steps with the ball in his hand. <laughs> four steps? Oh, was that? You couldn't take more you than four take, steps. Do you know, I, re- I really remember that coming in. Like, you can't take four well, steps. I, re- I remember it- Italia 90 being the, the trigger for no pass back yeah. because some of the games were so boring. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I remember it was about, you know, because keepers would just hold onto the ball and run around mm. the, the area. Um, so this was one, <laughs> one of the rules. But yeah, the four step rule. I, re- I really yeah. remember it coming in and like, everyone, oh, I can't, can't count the steps. <laughs> How many steps? <laughs> Paul always did a lot of that. A lot of passing back to, yeah, yeah. yeah messing yeah, around. Yeah. It's been really frustrating oh, to, fan to watch that. Yeah. yeah. So, so after a, an opening game draw, um, West Germany went on to they swept aside the Danes and the Spanish and their other two um, groups, group matches, and they qualified for the semifinals as group winners. I, it was a tournament of some really nice goals, one of which being uh, a goal that the, Ger- the West Germans scored against Spain with Lothar Mateus running 40 yards and then back heeling to Rudy Villa to run onto him <laughs> and, and <laughs> smash it into the corner. Uh, really, really Zola was brilliant in in tournaments for Germany. Yeah, yeah. He always scored. Uh, and another goal I really enjoyed watching was um, a free kick uh, by Gordillo for Spain from miles out. Absolutely came yeah. oh, really lovely strike. And Laudrup scored a great goal against Spain. Also in the same match as well. There's some. Uh, it was a three-two match actually to Spain. <laughs> um, but yeah, some some cracking goals which I'll get. We'll get to a few more. <laughs> yeah, um, there's, there's a couple I I, I, I kind of know. Yes, of. I'm sure. Yeah. Have seen. Have seen. Um, yeah. So the Italians then win a tight match against Spain uh, in their second game, one nil, with uh, Gianluca Vialli scoring the winner. Uh, uh, and then they a teammate of Mancini's at Sampdoria at the time. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, and then they <laughs> they beat an already eliminated Denmark to finish runners up. So the right. so the opening fixture was the the two qualifiers for the semi finals. In the other group, there are a few more shocks. Opening group game, England v Ireland, six minute goal for Ray Houghton, and, that, yeah. and that's how it finished. Ireland <laughs> Ireland with an English manor, manager walk away uh, with their. First win from their first game and in a major in a major tournament, beating one of their mm. neighbours. Um, Gary Lineker was unusually sluggish, and uh, and it was sort of commented on in in reviews of the game. But it turned out he he was later diagnosed with hepatitis B. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. So, he, so he was forgiven. He often he often had something wrong with yeah. him. <laughs> A couple of years later, he had a bit of an incident. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, in the other opening match of the of Group B or Group Two, the Soviet Union opened with a win over the Netherlands, one nil, mm-hmm. despite the Dutch Dutch dominance through most of the game. Yeah, uh, USSR held firm and got a got a got a winner in the second half. Um, then Netherlands. Faced England and uh, blew him away with a Van Basten hat trick in Peter Shilton's 100th game for England. <laughs> <laughs> wow. uh, the, I mean, Van Basten obviously start starting um, starting with a hat trick and uh, going on to score a few more goals. Uh, yeah, but, I mean, this was this was prime Van yeah, Basten era. Ruud Hillett, at Milan. Um, was captain and just was so in he just ruled the pitch he like his dis, <laughs> his distribution was just great and he just held, holds onto the ball and yeah. uh, he he set up a, yeah quite a lot of goals in this tournament but he's just yeah majestic majestic 
dominated a match, but also from a viewing point yeah. of view. Yeah, yeah. He was a big guy yeah. with his big hair. Yeah. You could always see him. He was just always in 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 eye shot, wasn't yeah, he? Yeah, couldn't help but follow him around the pitch. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, the Irish and the Soviets drew one-one, meaning that they they were joint leaders of the group with one game to go. Yeah. Uh, so in the final game, Netherlands needed to beat Ireland to to go through. They did so to qualify. So Ireland ended up in disappointment, getting. Um, knocked out in third place and uh the soviet union soundly thrashed england 3-1 to qualify top of the group so england end up with three losses from three and a goal difference of minus five. <laughs> oh god was it what was the famous irish goal oh yeah so i'll get so the fame was ronnie whelan's goal against the ronnie soviet whelan union. that's it yeah absolutely awesome yeah, <laughs> long throw in from the left hand side of the pitch, all the way across past the um, the 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 semicircle at the edge of the box, to, yeah. and ro- just on to Ronnie Raylan's left foot, and just straight into the top corner. It is a, a marvel <laughs> to watch it. What a what a goal! And yeah. like to hit it, like no bounces, just ah, oh, yeah, cracking goal. I mean, Ireland. That was that was some time to be an Irish football fan, wasn't it? Well, I think that. I think, and then Italian ninety, and then USA ninety four. I, I think I think yeah, a lot of Irish football fans were born <laughs> through, <laughs> yeah. through the success of this tournament, and then a lot, well, probably a lot of Ronnies and Rays were born. Yes, and Jacks, <laughs> and Jacks, yeah, a lot of Jacks. <laughs> so we get to the semi-finals and the first semi-final is a old rivalry between West Germany and the Netherlands. Um mm. having said that it's actually only the third time they'd played since the 1974 World Cup final. A penalty each made it 1-1 until Van Basten pops up and scores a winner in the 88th minute to give uh, the Dutch their first competitive victory against West Germany and and gain their first appearance in a European Cup final. So Van Basten didn't play in the first Netherlands game. Oh, really? Yeah, so he he was started on the bench, um, and uh, John Bosman was the striker for the Netherlands. Not the not the famous off of, off of the Bosman no, rule. No, different <laughs> different Bosman. Um, and Bosman was the leading scorer in qualifying. Right, and then played the first game, and then Van Basten had been struggling with injuries throughout most of the season. Yeah. Um, throughout most of his career, uh, yeah, and uh, and just sort of came came into top form for the tournament. But there was yeah. um, there was a game between Holland and um, Cyprus in the qualifying, which obviously Bosman had scored in, um, where uh, they think it was a bomb, maybe a firework, but it exploded close to the Cypriot goalkeeper who <laughs> who was stretched off and replaced. Uh, but then right. the Cypriot players left the field in protest and refused to continue playing. Right. Um, the Dutch side pressured the, the referee and decided that the game could continue and the match ended 8-0 <laughs> with Bosman establishing a national team record of five goals in one game. Wow. However... It wasn't officially recognised as UEFA decided the match was invalid, and Cyprus <laughs> were awarded a three 0 victory instead. Oh really? Yeah. Wow. So it's probably Cyprus's biggest ever win. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, obviously, the Netherlands ended up qualifying, and it was fine. There was one more interesting, funny thing that happened uh, in the first semi final, where Ronald Koeman swapped shirts with Olaf Thon at the end. And when yeah. um, stood in front of the German fans and wiped his ass with the, with the. Oh, oh wow! <laughs> Always oh, hated wow. Koeman. <laughs> wow. uh, he later apologised for it. <laughs> yeah, damage is um, done by then, though. Yeah. Surely. Yeah. Uh, well, it was. It was the um, the next meeting was Italia ninety, and that was the oh, the Rijkaard spit on Volo. Yeah. 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 Yes, it's definitely. Uh, I'd say I, I think it's the the fiercest rivalry in European international mm. football. I think. Yeah. Um. So second semi final, 
Italy versus the Soviet Union. Italy are favourites for this. They'd beaten the Soviet Union 4-1 in a friendly just two months prior. Yeah. But it um, wasn't to be. Soviets won 2-0 to make a record fourth appearance in a Euro, wow. Euro final. So we move on to the final with the host being eliminated. We're in uh, the Olympia Stadion in Munich, that famous wavy roof over oh yes yeah yeah the five one stadium (laughs) yeah yeah it was wasn't it yeah um it actually wasn't the closest of finals but it was exciting and was memorable for one particular moment um Mm. rude hillett scored the first goal and then we have so after having my 1970s uh Euro review being a, a very famous winning penalty. I think. Yes. I think I've. I think I've now got the with the Euro ninety eight probably the most famous winning goal of a of a Euro tournament. Yeah, I mean, just just one of the most famous goals in yeah. history. What a goal! Yeah. Mm. So, but what what do you reckon? Do you think that's more? Do you think the Van Basten volley is um, more iconic than the Penenka penalty? Yes. Yeah. Because it took more. Yeah. I mean, still, like, really high skill levels on both. Yeah. But it, then then put it in context, though. Penenka penalty, this is the penalty to win it. Yeah. Whereas Van Basten, is, it's, they're already 1-0 up. It's not, got, yeah. it's not got, quite you, got the pressure. But if you wanted to watch one back, you'd, you'd choose but Van it Basten. Is a th- it is a thing of beauty. <laughs> yeah. Um, so that that being became Van Basten's fifth goal of the tournament, and uh, he was the highest scorer. Uh, the next, there were only two other players that scored more than one goal in the tournament. Oh, really? Yeah. Wow. Um, and Rudy Boller. Rudy Boller was one of them. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, yes he was. And bearing in mind, Van Basten obviously played one less. Didn't play all the games as well. Yeah, I mean, the hat trick obviously helps. Netherlands take home their first ever major tournament win. Interestingly, four of the Netherlands players had just won the European Cup with PSV as well. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Yeah, Koeman. Yeah, that was when Koeman went to to Barcelona on the back of that tournament. Rui Hillet had just won the Italian league in his first season over there as well. It's Mm. very... um, Successful time for a lot of Dutch players. Yeah, I mean it's still still their only ever tournament win, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Um, yes. In the aftermath, the, one million people lined Amsterdam's canal for a canal boat uh, tour of the tra- of the team, the trophy. So they went along the canals for the trophy. Wow, one million in Amsterdam. Yeah, and quite a That's lot of houseboats cool. sunk under the weight of people standing on the top. <laughs> <laughs> and they they say that the the celebrations in Holland after the semi final win against West Germany were the biggest public gathering seen in the country since the end of the Second World War. Wow, that's incredible! And uh, the Soviets, having lost their third final, remain the only team to lose in three European finals. Wow, it's it's funny because you say about like the Dutch and the, their players being so successful at club le- level at that time, but the previous kind of successful Dutch team that got to those World Cup finals mm. would m- majority of the team were in the Ajax teams of the seventies that won three European Cups on the bounce. Yeah, so it kind yeah. of um, well, the manager of a lot. of um, the Netherlands was the same manager but he was back for his third out of four stints as, ma- was as manager yeah before you before you start euro 92 have you did you have you did yeah. you notice that the uh logo for the euros for all of these tournaments i think since the 70s is the exact same logo with a wavy uefa and then yeah, the colours yeah. of the flag of the host country over the top, and then yeah, I hadn't noticed that. Yeah, because I, I, I was gonna, I did actually purposely think, oh, was there a French logo for your eighty four? 
And I was like, oh, and that's when I saw, oh, it's always that same one, yeah. which is slightly different colours. Spoiler alert. They, it changes in it changed in ninety six. <laughs> okay. Well, we won't say that. Wanted to do the next episode. But yeah, the French did have a, 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 a mascot for the tournament, though, which I didn't say, which was a big a big cock. <laughs> Uh, the logo had been the same since the beginning 1960 oh since 1960 they just kept the same logo so yeah I mean Euro 88 was another followed Euro 84 another kind of classic tournament that everyone remembers to this day it really has come on a long way in the last kind of couple of tournaments, hasn't it? That takes us to Euro 92, which, uh, which Torben's going to tell us all about. Yes, Euro 92. Euro 1992. So Sweden were the hosts, um, off the back of hosting Eurovision uh, a few months before. Oh, so We love a Eurovision reference. They were, they were <laughs> showcasing themselves very well that year. Um, and it was a, a tournament of quite a few firsts and lasts as well. Yeah. Um, so we, uh, there was a new winner of the tournament. We'll come on to that later. <laughs> 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 it's the first time, uh, I believe that, that a, a team was, um, disqualified ahead of the tournament and another team invited to, to come in. So Yugoslavia due to the wars that they, that was going on there were disqualified. And as a result of that, um, as a result of the, the breakup of the country, um, Denmark were invited to um, to take their place, having come runners up in their qualifying group. Right, um, and which was a bit of a shame, actually, for well, obviously for a number of reasons. But Yugoslavia had actually had a very good qualifying campaign. Um, they had the the, the highest uh, goal scorer of the whole qualifying, and looked very good. It was the the last eight team format, so two groups of four. Yeah. Um, in qualifying, there's seven groups, um, and uh, the winner of each went through. And the host. Nation. And the host nation, of course, yeah. yeah. And, yeah, a lot of teams, uh, a lot of big names missed out on this one as well. So um, Spain only finished third in their group. Uh, France won theirs. Um, Scotland won their group. Um, ahead of Bulgaria, Romania, Switzerland, the Soviet Union, or as they were known in the tournament, the uh, the, the CIS national football team, which is the Commonwealth of Independent States, after right. the after the breakup of the Soviet Union, um, and as uh, so they qualified for the tournament, but yeah, they had uh, played under that that name, um, and it's also the first major tournament um, for a unified Germany as well. So was it? Was- Soviet Union team or the CIS team was it made up of the former Soviet countries? Yeah, almost all of them. Um, but there were some that weren't involved or that didn't have that weren't officially involved. However, yeah. one or two of the players from the, the the former Soviet Union that weren't part of the CIS still went through to play for them. Right. So it's a bit of a patch together, isn't it? So it's like they kind of they, the country split up, but they, they haven't had time to form new countries. <laughs> and, and yeah, teams. yeah, exactly. That. Yeah, they didn't have so. Yeah, you know, the next by the next tournament they have done, but yeah, so they hadn't. They kind of patched together a, a, a team, mm. um, and then uh, yeah, Yugoslavia topped their group, but but weren't able to play. So Denmark went through as runners up. Germany uh, won their group ahead of Wales and Belgium. Netherlands went through as winners of their group, beating Portugal, Greece, and England topped their group um, ahead of. Republic of Ireland, Poland, and Turkey. So, yeah, Italy didn't make it. Spain didn't make it. Belgium, Portugal. So, yeah, some big names yeah, yeah. that aren't there. The last uh, last tournament is an eight, eight team tournament. Um, it was also the last to uh, award the winner of each match with only two points in the group stages. So, after that, it became a bigger tournament. They got three points for a win. Right. Um, it was the the last before the introduction of the pass back rule uh, or the back pass rule, um, yes. which was brought in immediately after the tournament. We talked yeah. about that. Well, yeah, I thought it was after Italia 90 because I knew it was 94, it, USA 94. They didn't have it anymore. So after the highs of 1990 for England, um, 
England's in a bit of a transition um, and hire Graham Taylor after his successes with uh, Villa and with Watford earlier on in the, his managerial career. Mm. Big names, stalwarts such as uh, Shilton, Brian Robson, Terry Butcher had all retired. Uh, Paul Gascoigne hadn't played since his injury in the 1991 FA Cup final. Um, and Taylor had, had chosen to phase out Chris Waddle despite his um, his form at Marseille. Uh, where he was playing particularly well. Mm. He also opted against Ian Wright, who was top goal scorer in English football that season. Yeah. So he, he was... Lineker's still there. Lineker's yeah, still there. Still there. Yeah. So it's a, a transition time for England, but... Um, That's a lot of bold choices. A lot of bold choices, yeah. yeah. You, you, you know, an England manager nowadays will bow to the pressure of the media, perhaps, or, yeah. you know, at least uh, make... There's always one or two controversial decisions isn't there going into a tournament yeah. um you know over the years there's, there's there's always one or two names where it could be leaving out waddle is huge yeah right yeah. right the right one seems yeah right but Shearer was Shearer there Shearer was there yeah, yeah so, so that's so early so early in this tournament he was young as well at that point Shearer yeah, yeah. 92 yeah it was so early days smaller squads than we're used to as well wasn't it yeah. yeah, so they only took they're only allowed to take twenty. Yeah. Um although England only only managed to take nineteen. Brilliant. Because uh, by all accounts, um Taylor selected Mark Wright, but didn't realise that he was injured. And on the day where they were <laughs> on the day where they were heading off, he's like, Oh, where's where's Mark Wright? And one of his teammates said, oh, he's still up in Liverpool. <laughs> Um, but by then the deadline had passed and they couldn't bring in another player. So they went with 19 oh rather God. than 20. It, we, th- we kind of think of Graham Taylor as a really unlucky England manager because of the, you know, the, the, the do or not like that stuff. But, you know, yeah. there's some, there's, you, you're presenting an argument that maybe he wasn't just unlucky. Yeah, I'm, not, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not presenting him in a great light here. Yeah. Um, and then there was injuries as well for England. Uh, Rob Jones, Lee Dixon, Gary Stevens at right back. Um, and Dixon twisted his ankle running in the woods to keep fit, apparently. So. <laughs> <laughs> Not even in some sort of big tackle in a cup final or anything. Yeah, so Denmark were invited in and um, and and proved to be uh, quite a decent team in this particular tournament. Um, <laughs> they hadn't qualified. Uh, they'd had, as we previously, previously talked about, they'd had... Um, uh, some good success um, for their nation, qualified for tournaments and actually mm. done quite well in, in the mid eighties uh, with the likes of Michael Laudrup and played with a certain uh, attacking style. Yeah, um, yeah. And uh, with a song, they're red, we're, we're red, we're white, we're Danish dynamite. <laughs> um, Danish dynamite. Yeah. That was the, <laughs> that was the uh, kind of catchy line. The well, they sung it in English. Uh, I guess so, yeah. <laughs> um, it didn't rhyme in Danish. <laughs> no, maybe it did. But they hadn't qualified for um, for the World Cup uh, 90, um, and so they had made some changes to the man- uh, management. Um, they had hired a manager who hadn't actually finished his previous role, was still technically employed, mm. and so they had to uh, reverse on that decision and ended up going with what be- what was – thought to be their third or fourth choice on the list in the end um in nielsen and he was uh he, he was playing a, a lot more of a defensive style and not the uh not the uh, attacking dynamite version that, that the team had been uh, um famous for and the players enjoy playing so so actually in this tournament michael laudrup despite being one of the greatest players at the time on the planet um and having had such high form with uh, with Barcelona winning the league uh, with them, Michael and his brother Brian decided to 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 quit at the age of twenty six, and uh, I'm not sure how old Brian was, but off the back of that, they they decided not to not to play under Nielsen. Mm. So he's handicapped going into it. Although he did manage to to talk Brian into coming back, and so Brian did play, but right. but Michael didn't. Michael didn't. So that's Peter Schmeichel in goal. Peter Schmeichel in, in goal, indeed. So. Um, so yeah, it's format, uh, two teams, sorry, two groups of four, um, the top two qualifying to go through to, to the knockout stage. Um, England are in a group with France, Denmark, and the host Sweden. And in the other group, 
uh, the Netherlands, Germany, Scotland, and CIS, formerly known as the Soviet Union. Sounds like a sounds like a furniture store. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, they weren't like that in Sweden. <laughs> so the yeah, it starts off uh, starts off a little bit slow. A um, couple of draws. So England uh, England drew nil nil with Denmark. Sweden drew with France one all. Uh, England then have a another nil nil with France. Oh. So they're now two draws, um, needing to win or at least get something from from their last game against Sweden, who were the hosts. So yeah, going into the final. Final game of the group. Uh, England need to get a result. They score early on with uh, with David Platt, um, who who's one of England's top goal scorers, I think, from midfield mm. over the years. Yeah. Uh, certainly as a ratio, yeah. it's uh, it scored a lot of good goals. And so, yeah, England score early in that that game. David Platt after just four minutes, um, and then Sweden just start to to get a bit more of a grip on the game. Um, they equalised just after half time. Um, home crowd, uh, the, the, the nerves start to, to get into England a little bit, and then there's the famous Barry Davis commentary <laughs> of Brolin, Darlene, Brolin, brilliant! <laughs> right into the top corner, 82nd minute, crushed England hearts, and Sweden go through. Yes, it seems to be. It, it seems to be the common theme of Graham Taylor's England career was just. Uh, Classic commentary, <laughs> not in his favour. <laughs> um, what was it like in the Kane household in that game? Do you, do you know what? I can't. I can't quite remember. But I'm. I've. Whenever they. Uh, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm. I'm more supportive of England than I, than I am Sweden. Although when the two teams are playing each other, yeah, a little bit, a um, little bit torn loyalties. But yeah, I'll always prefer an England win Sweden than a Sweden win. Yeah. Um, Thing is, it's your mum that's Swedish, and I can't imagine she's that bothered about football. <laughs> not too bothered, no, no, she's not too bothered. Bless her. <laughs> so, in the other, the other, um, the other final game in the group, uh, Denmark beat France two one. Uh, it's an early goal from Larsen. Uh, France equalised after sixty minutes with Jean Pierre Papin. Ah, Papin. You might remember, scored some good goals. Um, and then Denmark scored uh, to put themselves through 2-1 uh, with 12 minutes to go. So in the other group, um, the Netherlands beat Scotland 1-0. Dennis Bergkamp, Germany and uh, the CIS is one all. Um, Hassler with a... with a, is, there, is there much of that Dutch team from 88 remaining? <laughs> yeah, there is actually. Yeah, so you've got... Uh, who have you got? You've still got Rijkaard there. Yeah. Um, Van Basten is still there. Yeah. Koeman. Um, okay. So, you know, some big names. Philip's still captain. Yeah, Philip's still captain. Yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, you'd be still be expecting them to be challenging the Dutch after after 88 in Italia 90. Yeah. Still kind of high hopes for Holland in this tournament. I yeah, imagine. still a great team, being the holders as well yeah. at that time as and well. The so. Germans going in as world champions, of course. Yeah, and, <clears> and now unified. So, um, yeah, so another group. another Holland Germany matchup. Yeah, third tournament in a row. Indeed, and that was their the, the last game of the group. Um, Klinsman scores for Germany, um, but that was only to make it two one because uh, Netherlands has already scored twice through Rijkaard and uh, Wichka, um, uh who scored um, a really good free kick. I say really good, uh, an impressive <laughs> free kick from really far out, but it just stayed really low and goes into the far corner. Oh, wow. yeah. But it looks kind of quite, it's almost because it's not in the air, it almost looks like it's slow motion and the keeper probably should have done better, yeah, but yeah. Um, he drills it. Um, and then Burkamp scores to make it 3 1. Germany still go through those uh, as runners up in the group. Yeah. Uh, and Netherlands. Was there anyone called Muller playing for Germany? <laughs> 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 probably oh I didn't confirm that there were no Mullers there were no Mullers in 88 either oh, oh there you go um, and but Riedler and Hassler Effenberg there's some big names Sammer Klinsmann oh there is there, there's a there's a there is a Muller there's a an O umlaut Muller as opposed to a U umlaut so there's a Muller oh, is that, that Muller the one that Muller 
scored the winning penalty against us in '96. There you go. Oh, really? Oh, well, yeah. Mm. Spoiler. Sorry. <laughs> Next time. Next time. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, into the semi-finals, the Netherlands and Denmark face up. Uh, I mean, Holland must be heavy favourites going into that. Yeah, the Danes having sneaked through qualifying. Well, they yeah sneaked through qualifying. Um, but yeah, I don't, I, they're going into the match favourites. Uh, you know, you look at the lineups, um, and it's uh, an interesting game. Den- Denmark get an early goal through Larsen. Um, Netherlands equalised through Burkamp. Denmark go 2-1 up, Larsen again, and then it's half-time, uh, and then it's a fairly quiet second half, uh, but right uh, in the last few minutes, Rijkaard scores an equaliser to take it into extra time. Uh, no further goals in extra time, so it goes to penalties. Koeman scores his, Larsen scores his, and then Van Basten misses. Of all people. Of all the people. Van Basten misses. And Denmark go on to to score all of theirs. Uh, Burkamp, Rijkaard, uh, Wichka score all of theirs, and uh, Denmark go through five four on penalties. If only Van Basten, scorer of the iconic winning goal from the previous tournament, had done a Penenka famous yeah. <laughs> winning penalty of a, another tournament. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, it. No, um... I feel like we were, we were robbed of a an amazing final of. Holland Germany yeah. final. Yeah, that's after, true. After what had been happening for the previous yeah. few tournaments, no Eastern. Yeah, that would have been tasty. No Eastern European representation of semi-finals, which I think is very rare for the tournament so far. Yeah. What with yeah. uh, the Soviets and Hungary, and we had Yugoslavia featured in a couple, and mm. Czechoslovakia. Czechoslovakia, yeah, yeah. But it's a very not just Western European, Northern European. Yeah, yeah, dominant. dominant. And it was Peter Schmeichel who saved Van Basten's penalty. Oh, he saved it, did he? Yeah, he yeah. saved it. So, you know, it was a big uh, launch pad for his for his career at that, at that stage to take him. I guess it was shortly after that that he joined United. Um, I think he might have already been at United. Was he already there? Yeah. Around that yeah. time. I think it was 90 or 91 he went to United. Oh, okay. Off the top of my head. I'll have to check. <laughs> <laughs> so Sweden, the hosts... Uh, in the other semi-finals, Sweden versus Germany, um, and uh, Germany take an early lead. Uh, Brolin gets uh, a penalty. Um, Germany score twice in in the second half, uh, and Sweden get a late goal, but it's not enough to take it through to extra time. Germany win three two. Yeah, so then it's Denmark Germany in the uh, in the final. Yeah, Denmark just kind of. Uh, did enough, dominated, uh, you know, not necessarily dominated the match, but but 2 0 win. Uh, Jensen and uh, Vilfort, uh, famous goal for for them, and and Denmark win the win the tournament, having not qualified. <laughs> um, and it's their first ever, first and to date only major honours <laughs> in in world. Incredible. It feels like every game they were going in as underdogs, yeah, as well as just the tournament, yeah. Like every single game, it, like you, they're playing somewhere you'd expect them to lose to, and they just and keep they getting results, going and going and going and going until they, until they beat the Germans in the final. God, incredible! Beating the Germans in the final on Swedish soil as well. So you know they're they're kind of you know big rivals, uh, neighbourly rivals there. So uh, yeah, probably a sweet tournament for them to win. Um, <laughs> you know, and lots of lots of decent goals in the tournament. Um, Hassler free kick, Jean Pierre Papa. Uh, Riedler, Burkamp's goals, the the Brolin one versus England. Um, Dennis Burkamp scored a great goal against Denmark. So yeah, there's some really good goals, really decent tournament. Um, just as an England fan, you just don't really remember it in such <laughs> no, a high regard. I, I, I literally have no, apart from the Brolin goal against us, mm. I, I really don't remember any of the rest of the tournament. No, no, it wasn't. Uh, it's, yeah, it's. It, but if you were Danish, you would. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, yeah, definitely. And actually, that, I, I was looking at some other. The, the it's quite a low. I mean, I guess the Swedish stadiums aren't particularly big, but um, there's some particularly low attendances. So, for example, the Scottish Scottish game against the CIS, formerly Soviet Union, <laughs> where Scotland win three 0 So it's probably one of their one of their best games in the. Uh, 
you know, in a major tournament, especially against the former Soviet Union, who, who, who are a big name themselves. Um, but only uh, only just under 15,000 people watching that. So, um, yeah. to be fair, in the New York Hopping Stadium, that might have been full capacity. Yeah, yeah that's right. <laughs> <laughs> I just looked... I just, Leclerc, McAllister penalty. I just looked up because I thought uh, I wanted to know what the um, odds were on Denmark before the tournament. Thinking, oh, I wonder how it compared to the Leicester odds before the uh, Premier yeah. League. Yeah, or Greece, Greece 2004, yeah. was it? No, yeah, yeah. it doesn't come close. The, the, the Danes were the rank outsiders, but the odds were 20 to 1. <laughs> so, I guess an 18 well, tournament. Yeah. It's, uh, You'd have had to have bet a lot of money to have, to have seen yeah. some returns on there. You'd have to bet after Yugoslavia, probably. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah true. <laughs> Yeah, it seems the war kicked off. Quick, there's a Denmark war going aren't in the tournament. New war I'd like to place a bet on Denmark <laughs> to win the league, to win the Euros, mate. They're not. They haven't qualified. We don't have any odds. Still, <laughs> you never know. It's like one from Old Moore's Almanac. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs>